Welcome to Unite Now. This is an XP in the XP series on live ops or running your game as a service. Hi guys, my name is Xavier Peterman. I'll be presenting this alongside Robin. Uh, I'm currently senior producer at Ludia, working on a, a game with uh, Disney. I previously worked at numerous studios, Gameloft, Wars World, Playfish, most of them being uh, mobile game studios some of them being uh, uh, aimed towards uh, MMO web-based games, or at the time, a long while ago, CD-ROM games. Uh, worked on, on numerous games in the past years, mostly mobile, and uh, super happy to be here. I'm Robin Gazai. I'm Senior Product Manager for Unity on Game Growth. I've been in the games industry for about 20 years, uh, starting as a QA tester on Heroes of Might Magic 3 for the Sega Dreamcast. Um, before joining Unity, I worked at Gameloft for over 15 years, holding various positions in Canada, Japan, China. Uh, I've been a producer for uh, 10 of those years, working on some console games, but also mostly on free-to-play mobile games. Back in the days, uh, creative vision was everything to game making. Story, gameplay, setting, all art style, all carefully crafted to create a product people will want to spend 50 bucks on. Sure, marketing was very important back then, but nailing that 90 plus Metacritic score was paramount to success. That was before free to play. Free to play has broken the accessibility barrier. It's harder and harder to justify spending that $50 price for entry for a game you've only seen in screenshots and trailers, when there are games out there that you can basically play as much as you want for free. But players playing for free doesn't mean food on the table, and that has led to a more complex business equation to enter the mix. Things like lifetime value, retention, engagement, user acquisition, analytics. Modern games are no longer simply products. They are now services. Fun, and creative vision are still critical to success, of course, but as part of a greater business offering. Free-to-play games are equally part game and part business, and running a live service means you need to think in terms of running live operations, live ops. Here's an overview of the agenda we'll have for this session. Running live ops boils down to three, three easy steps, operate, analyze, Update. Operate is everything to do with your live build. It is your user acquisition. It is your in-app purchase sales. It is your events, your customer support, etc. Analyze is when you crunch your numbers on the data you gathered while operating your game. What works, what didn't, what needs improvement. This in turn will feed your roadmap and determine what will go into your next client update. And this live up loops starts from the moment your users have your game in their hands. After all the work you've put into crafting and launching your game, the real work starts with live ops. Before, you were working on assumptions, on educated guesses, on intuition and experience. Now, you're working with live users and everything you do needs to tie into the live ops feedback loop. Working with live users means everything you do from now on will have repercussions on your user base. You must tread carefully and methodically. We're gonna talk about preparing for a live ops because essentially what you're doing with your soft launch is preparing for the full launch, but even the soft launch itself deserves some time to prepare before the launch actually starts. And there's a couple of ingredients to do this. So the first thing you got to figure out is your actual constraints. Uh, they're essentially the same for all types of projects. They are basically scope, resources, and time. And this is true for every type of game that you'll work on. You got to figure out yours. If you have a game that needs to be uh, on at Christmas, then you have a time constraint. If you have a very limited budget and a few people that are on the payroll, and that are just burning down your budget, well, you have resources limitation. Figure these out because they will help you figure out your strategy for your whole soft launch and after that, even uh, the worldwide launch. One of the things you want to do is 
carefully observe the competition. If they're doing something right, maybe there's something to learn from them. At Luria, we use Sensor Tower. We uh, also have a past working relationship with App Annie. Both are great. They have their strengths and weaknesses. They have their ways of approaching things, but they're quite equivalent. So you should consider both. Uh, I know that Sensor Tower has an indie pricing that they can offer to you guys. Uh, they have 14 days free trial and then not too expensive monthly fees. Definitely consider uh, uh, trying those out to see how your competition is doing. We see example interfaces there. You can, uh, you'll be able to see downloads, revenues, retention, all of the KPIs, KPIs meaning, of course, uh, key performance indicators, all of the KPIs of your competitors, and you can learn what they do well and, and how you can uh, do a better game yourself. When you look at the KPIs, you will see, of course, that they don't perform at the same level all the time. There are some that are better than others. Uh, so it will be real, really interesting for you to try to identify what are the key success factors. How come is competitor six doing better than competitor one? What are they doing different? And the, the yellow graph I'm putting here is just an example of observing one KPI, but you should observe at least uh, some KPIs for acquisition, some for engagement, and some for monetization. And the process is all the same. Figure out who does better, who doesn't, and then position yourself compared to these ones. What we will see in green is you anticipating your numbers. How well do you think you will do? And in terms of it will even, it will even help you build a PL and see where your money can go because uh, probably your resources aren't unlimited. So you need to figure out where you put your efforts and where you put your money. This will be a great exercise to try to figure it out. Something else I like to do when I start a game is to observe the motivations of the, of the competitors. Who plays what game for what? And what you see there is a model that's been put together by Quantic Foundry. Uh, it's quite common across the industry. I know it was used at Gameloft when I was there. Uh, it's used at Luria. And it's just a great way to see the reasons uh, uh, the players play your game and what they expect out of it. And on the next slide, what we see is an example of how a fictional, a, a, a specific game would rate against many of these uh, motivation factors. And if you look at a game that is really close to what you're doing and they score really high on a motivational uh, aspect, you should probably piggyback on that and include some of what they do in your game. Another thing that I strongly encourage to do before you even start Live Ops is to have a backlog of all the features that you want to put uh, in your game. Uh, generally, you don't. Uh, your initial releases will not have all features because, uh, by definition, you're not ready. So you'll have a backlog of stuff that goes in. What I like to do before I even launch a game is to figure out some kind of backlog of the different features that can go into the game. And very probably, you haven't put all the features in the game yet because you're still in self launch. So the order in which you release the subsequent features can be determined by a very calculation such as this one. How strong a feature is at doing something, uh, probably based on the motivation that we saw on the previous slide, and how much you actually need that thing. On the previous slide, we saw fantasy was really strong. So if something delivers on fantasy and it delivers really well on fantasy, it fulfills it, then you probably have something strong. And you divide it by the multiplication of cost and risk. And all of that gives you some kind of number that you can use to prioritize the different features and introduce them in the game uh, in, in the order that makes sense. And in order to make a plan, a couple of things you should really look at. Uh, the first one is obviously platforms. You don't necessarily release on iOS and on Android and on all countries and on all users at the same time. Probably you want to start with a tech launch, maybe just on iOS, maybe just on Android, probably not both, to at least start to figure out, is your game working? Uh, is it too buggy? Can users actually understand what's going on? So you'll limit your risks by starting small. Same thing for territories. 
Don't start worldwide, of course. That's what a soft launch it is. It's limited territories. Start with the smaller countries, what we call tier three, that aren't as expensive to acquire in terms of users. Uh, they don't monetize as well, but the, it's a great learning ground um, to, to just figure out uh, what your game is about. Then you can move to tier one countries. Once again, from tier three to tier one is just an expression of how well these money these countries monetize and how expensive it is to acquire users in those countries. User acquisition is probably the one big thing you should plan because it's expensive. It's probably not unlimited. It isn't for anyone. So uh, keep some money to do some small bursts following updates when you really want to learn how your new update is, is performing and you get that day seven to day 14 to day 30 retention numbers, you get it early because by definition, it takes a while to get. And if you could get some organics, that's even better. Uh, have a Facebook group, a Facebook group on which you post about updates. Uh, keep in touch with your, your players. Uh, that's always good to have. And don't burn the golden cohort. What we call the golden cohort is the first players who enter a game. They're generally the most dedicated, uh, the most enthusiastic, the most monetizing, the most likely to retain. And if your game is not up to par, up to par with these guys, they're probably not going to come back. So make sure you prepare uh, in, in smaller territories, uh, limited, uh, uh, limited uh, platforms to limit the risks. Uh, an option you could consider is uh, a feature uh, called Google Play Early Access or Open Beta. Um, it's about controlling downloads and uh, limiting your star rating. That's essentially it. You can control how many users download it uh, to make sure it doesn't get downloaded by too many players at the same time. And your star ratings will be there, but only visible by you. Uh, so it doesn't affect uh, your capacity to get featured later down the road. And it's it's very forgiving uh, for that aspect. But you have to know it's not meant to really check your KPIs. KPIs are biased. There's a special kind of user that goes there. And it's not the real thing in terms of KPI, but it's a real good learning ground to start with. So you've launched your game. You've done your open beta. You've done your soft launch. Uh, and now you have to update your game. So updates are critical to keeping your users engaged with your game. They will be your main vector for pushing new features and content. Pushing regular updates can be taxing for you and your team. Consider opting for a TikTok update strategy where on a tick, you push new content or features and on a talk, you, you focus on quashing bugs and quality of life improvements for your users. Oftentimes, Maintaining interoperability between old and new versions can be tedious, if not impossible. An update prompt system can be a good investment to make sure your game is running smoothly. Try to spend some time thinking about how you will package your updates. Platform packaging tools are now smarter and help you deliver lean updates, but it never hurts to do some of the legwork upfront. Oversized updates do tend to churn some percentage of your users. And as you probably paid an ad network to acquire these users, losing them means losing your investment. Let's face it, most people will get bored of your game eventually, no matter how good it is. To get that long tail retention and keep your players engaged, events are a must. Events create replay value for your game and varies the gameplay. A well-crafted event calendar will pace the week and give purpose to a player's daily sessions. Special events, when run on days of high affluence, weekends, holidays, will generate good revenue spikes for your game and can serve as a way to release new content. Uh Events are really going to be the core of your live ops uh, once the game reaches maturity. And uh, it's really important to test them and development, develop them in the course of uh, your soft launch and your lab outs in general. Really focus on events. This is a major part of, of free-to-play live ops, if not the major part. Uh, one thing you want to do is play with different durations. You can have daily events. You can have almost hourly events. 
Uh, you can have seasonal events that last for a month or more. Uh, you want to also play with the schedule to have uh, something that people can expect to always have something going on. So when people join at any time, there is an event that is going on. Uh, they're a good way to add gameplay variety, uh, different types of gameplay. You can have collection events, competitive events, different, really different kind of things. Make sure you give meaningful goals to your players. Meaningful in the sense that, once again, going back to motivation, look at the motivation players have in playing your game and events should deliver on more of that. Uh, if your game is about collecting and you have an event that is about collection, probably is going to be more effective than it's about social or something else. And speaking of social, uh, it pretty much is always very strong. There are some exceptions, but they're, they're, uh, they're, they're not that common. Generally, in any type of game, add social if you can. It makes for a stronger experience. It's really strong in retention because people build, uh, build uh, connections and, and just bond with other players and it gives an extra meaning to those events of that gameplay. And uh, just for the note, what you see on the right in ex is an example from a Ludia game that's called Jurassic World Game that is uh, performing quite well. And what you see, it's really small, but essentially from day one to day seven, you see all the different type of events that will be going on at the same time. Some are just promotional events like get that car for that, that much money. Some are way deeper in terms of gameplay and there's this recurrence that is going there. So there's these kinds of appointment mechanics that will bring uh, users back in to play your game. We've talked before about quality of life improvements. Frustration is a major factor of churn. Bugs and other irritants can significantly hinder your growth potential. Churned users need to be replaced and new users cost money. Scour your review pages, Reddit, fan pages, look for user feedback wherever you find it and make a list of things that annoy your users. Taken individually, it's nearly impossible to assign a specific value to a single bug or US flaw in your game, but taken together, it improves the overall polish and can make the difference between a churned and a retained user. When using the TikTok update approach, you should still dedicate a certain portion of every sprint to bug fixes and quality of life improvements. Those pesky, hard to reproduce crashes are certainly annoying to fix, but they are even more annoying to your users. If your team of less than 10 people got a crash only once, if you multiply that across an entire audience of thousands, that makes a lot of crash sessions. One thing that's cool about Google Play is that you can compare your crash rate to other similar apps. And guess what? Your competitors' game do not crash. Tools like Crashlytics go a long way to help you zero in on what makes your game unstable. It's free, you should use it. As an indie developer, you might not have the resources to have a community manager on your team, and that's understandable. However, your community is important to you and to your game. Creating a sense of belonging around your game helps you retain your users. And as we saw previously, you can leverage it to improve your metrics. So even if you don't have a community manager, you can still curate your own Facebook page. Your game's Facebook page should look clean and be updated regularly. Why not launch your updates during a live Twitch feed? Interact with your users on Reddit and Twitter. Set up a Discord channel. These are all things that you or your team members can do and will improve the sense of community in your game. Monetization is a key part of free-to-play and of live ops. IEP, or in-app purchases, are where most of the money in free-to-play is. How you monetize your game through IEP is highly dependent on your game genre. A basic IEP monetization strategy usually involves creating bundles that pack on extra value than just those plain old coins or gem packs that you have. Choose one bundle that you want to push more than others. Let's say your starter bundle. Oppose it to another bundle that also has good value, but not quite. That will be your decoy. Decoy are like that strategy that magazine subscription do. 
one month for $12, $60 for the whole year. Some people might only need one month, but most people interested in that magazine will fork over $60 for the full year. The value is just too good to pass on. So that $12 month to month subscription is their decoy. Though a decoy is usually used to upsell, in the case of free to play, where a tiny fraction of players end up monetizing through IAP, it can make sense to have a higher priced decoy just to show how amazing value that starter pack is. As a rule of thumb, a user who made a purchase in a free-to-play game will usually have a much better retention and is also more likely to purchase again than someone who never did. The final piece of your IAP strategy is your anchors. Use your regular coin or gen packs to give meaning to the value of your bundles. For example, if you offer 200 gems for $1.99, make sure your 199 bundle has at least 200 gems. That way, your prospective customer will know how much value that starter pack really offers and will be more likely to buy it. If your shop is configurable, try to display your bundle, your decoy, and the anchor on the same screen for maximum effect. Once you have this figured out, you need to put it in a store. And store layout is, is essential to the experience. My number one advice, don't reinvent the wheel. Just go with what works. I'm putting different examples on the screen right now of different games and different genres. They all have in common that they, they're successful. That's the only thing that they have. And essentially what you see is pretty much always the same pattern. Clear offerings, six to eight different SKUs at the same time, not more than that because it's over overwhelming, not less than that because it feels poor as an offer. Uh, keep it simple, simple works, and offer what your players crave. Either it's hard currency, soft currency, uh, bundles, whatever that is. Once again, look at your competition and make sure it's in line with what your, what your users are just willing to pay for, what, what's worth it for them. Play with the price points. I remember a game I worked on that had a, a, a good conversion rate and the, the most of the transactions were uh, the cheapest price point, which was $1. And we experienced putting it at $2 just to see what happened. And the conversion rate uh, pretty much remained the same, which means we almost double our revenues uh, overnight just by playing with the price point uh, because just people were willing to pay for it because they felt it was worth it. So play with your price points. Uh, it's, it's, it's worth it. Tracking is critical. If there is one thing you want to track, it is definitely uh, your transactions because this is what's going to be paying for the, the hard work that you put into your game. So it's, it's really worth it. And uh, you should explore special offers, special ways to, to uh, monetize your players. Subscri subscriptions work well. At Ludia, we use them extensively. Uh, we're quite good at it and uh, they add something to in the vicinity of 20, 30% to your income without cannibalizing your microtransactions. Time-limited offers uh, also work well. Starter packs that are custom made for your early uh, users uh, that tell them, hey, you're new, we think you could want this, it will make your game a better experience. And the nice thing about starter packs is uh, once people buy them, they're more committed to your game and more likely to just stick around and play. So it helps retention as well. And there's others. Uh, once again, I can't say that enough. Look at your competitors, what they're doing, learn from them. Uh, if there's stuff that seems to work for them, try it in your own game. If your game has any significant number of users, having ads is a sure bet. Rewarded videos should be at the top of your list. And if possible, be given some thought during your design phase. Well thought out rewarded video placement will provide value to your users and will not only create a stable baseline income for a game, but it will also give you a small retention boost. You should expect your most engaged users to be your most avid rewarded video watchers. As most ad networks will pay you on converted users, that is users who installed the game or app from the ad they were shown, Favor placements that are near natural end of session points. Placing a rewarded video right before starting a level may convince many users to watch it, but few will convert and the placement will fail to drive revenue. 
Regarding interstitials, I know a lot of game developers dislike them, and I don't blame them. However, interstitial ads can give a good boost to your ad revenue. But poorly integrated, they can also lower the perceived value of your game and incur churn. Interstitial ads are far more tolerated by your users than you would think. Good interstitial placement and pacing should not affect your retention. Take a cue from live television. They will never show a commercial break before you are hooked in the show. They never show ads mid-scene. And they will show more ads when you are least likely to churn. If you follow these simple rules, your interstitial ad implementation will be tasteful, and you can generate revenue from every player. And just like live premium cable TV, if your users are paying, don't show them interstitials. Every business needs analytics. Without it, you can't know your users. You, can know, you can't know how they interact with your app. You won't know how to align your game's roadmap with success. Analytics are only as good as how you implemented them. Don't try to track everything. Your time investment will skyrocket and the quality of your data will suffer. Instead, think of how you would use your data to drive your decision making. When implementing a feature, think of how you would determine whether it was a success or not. That's what you need to track. Beyond that, there are a few things that are always good to track. Real money transactions, your tutorial. By tracking your tutorial, you can create a funnel which will show you whether you have issues with your onboarding. Economy, everything related to your game economy helps you balance your game. It will also tell you whether your syncs and your taps are performing as designed. Gameplay, you could track the success rate for all your levels, that way if there are um, frustration point in your game, you will know. And finally, technical. Loading times, frame rate, crash rate, device info, all things that will help you improve your game. Funnel analysis. So as mentioned, if you track your tutorial, you can optimize your game's onboarding. When looking at your, uh, at your funnel graph, usually steep is bad. It means through every step you're losing player. Smooth is good, uh, which means that players are proceeding briskly through their, through their onboarding funnel. And gentle is best, when the near 100% of your users are completing the tutorial. In your graph, sometimes you can see chunking, meaning from one step to the other, a large percentage of players are dropping. These usually show a potential problem. It could be technical, like a crash. It could be user experience, like something your players didn't understand. However, sometimes it can also just mean that the player is not interested in your game. It's not his cup of tea. Using, um, using qualitative uh, uh, usability tests, like we'll discuss later, is a good way to assign a qualitative uh, a data point to a quantitative data point uh, like your funnel. So what we're seeing here is two representations of the exact same thing, uh, two different views to help you understand better. Uh, we have all the steps that users go through uh, in the first time user experience of the game I'm working on right now, which is Disney Wonderful World. It's in soft launch in, in a couple of countries. All the steps are there. And uh, what you're seeing is in blue, a uh, previous version, and in, in yellow, uh, another version that has some fixes added to it, both in terms of bugs and, and, and design and lots of other things. The view on the bottom is how many users are uh, have an each specific step as their last step. So if the number is high, it means that they churned at this point. So what you should do is identify and fix those, cho those choke points. And when you do that, be aware that uh, you will have a cascade effect. What this means is, version 1.1.9 in blue had a bigger choke that was then fixed in the yellow version. So less people turn there, but it has the cascade effect that later down the road, players 
who now stay but aren't as committed, of course, have a little more tendency to leave. But it's just another choke point that you will resolve in time. And so on and so on, choke point after choke point, you will make sure your experience is as smooth as possible and you'll be able to retain some users. The other one is another type of representation, but it's pretty much the same. It's a content funnel. So uh, what the game we're doing is a match three game. And this is the level by level uh, retention, different balancing uh, that we've done and how they've changed over time. So the red is a very early version and the yellow is a more recent version. And you see how it can fluctuate a lot from level to level. Keep in mind that free to play is also about friction. So you will never get a game that retains everyone all the time. And it's not something you want. For example, in our match three game, we have levels that are designed to be walls. They're just tougher and people need to go through them. And of course, retention is gonna be lower. Uh, that's just a normal state of things. So you have to acknowledge that too. And many types of funnels you can do uh, like that. A-B testing. A-B testing is a very trendy in free to play mobile games. Generally speaking, A-B testing helps you align better with what resonates with your users. The more you know about the interaction between game and players, the more successful you can be. The learnings from a well-implemented A-B test will give you wealth of knowledge and help you drive successful future development. However, A-B testing shouldn't be a mantra. Sometimes the time burden is not worth it. Sometimes you will not have enough data for results to be conclusive. For example, if your game doesn't have a huge volume of payers, perhaps A-B testing IAP is not appropriate for you. At low sample sizes, a lucky whale will throw your analysis into disarray. It's great you got a whale, but it might skew your analysis towards the wrong decision. Tread lightly. Usability tests are a great way to get some knowledge uh, to really see how users are playing your game. Uh, one of the software that we use, or rather company that we use uh, for this is Playtest Cloud that I know is being used by a number of studios. They have some affordable uh, options that, that should be considered by Indy. But regardless, even if you can't afford them, just make sure you see your users play the game and it will give you a, a way deeper understanding of how your game works. It will give you precise points of how they're interacting with the game. And you, you'll figure things out way, way more effectively. Uh, you'll be able to give some context over your data. You're seeing some choke points. You don't know why, and then you test with five users, and they you realize that four of these five do not realize where the button is or how they're supposed to use a feature or what a text really means, and you can fix it. And you don't need a lot of people for that. Just four to five users gets uh, gets you real far in terms of learning of what the, the real user experience is. And when you test, ask people to think out loud. Have your users ideally video uh, so you can observe the gameplay, you can identify the pain points. You ask your users to think out loud so you understand what they understand and what they don't understand. And ask questions with measurable answers. On a scale of 10, how are you likely to use that feature again? On a scale of 10, how do you think this works or doesn't work? It will help you compare versions to versions. And uh, as I mentioned, Playtest Cloud, something that should be investigated. Uh, sometimes a bit on the expensive side, but really worth it if you guys can afford it. Key takeaways. So plan your live ops ahead of time. When working with live users, you don't want to turn them. You want to retain them. So the more planning goes into your live ops, the better. Plan your soft launch, use it, uh, and make necessary changes to be ready for uh, your global launch. Data is your friend. Your, ha your, your game is with live users. So you have data, you have feedback, use it, leverage it, and make your app better. Prioritize retention. A lot of your users will come through user acquisition, which is paid. It's expensive. It's an investment. If you lose these users, you lose your investment. Prioritize retention, and revenue will come. Be open to change. So even if you plan your live ops ahead of time and create a great strategy, if it doesn't resonate with your users, you should be open to changing it. 
whatever works for your users is what will work is what will work for you and what will bring you success. So that ends the presentation. If you have any questions, post them in the comment, and it will be Xavier and I's pleasure to answer them. Thank you, Xavier, and thank you for watching. Thanks, guys. It's been a pleasure.